morning. Have you quarreled with your partners before? Husband and wife, have you quarreled before? Which husband and wife have not quarreled? Please put up. Okay, I know Chen Bing and the Mary Mary have not quarreled before. Because it's not for quarreling, theirs is called Scooby. Who's <laughs> Kobu? That one is for us, I guess. Huh? Okay, we, we all have quarrels, and uh, boyfriend, girlfriend have quarrels, friends among friends have quarrels, siblings have quarrels, parent, child have quarrels too. And to make up or to reconcile, to forgive, and to be on friendly terms again, sometimes it's not that easy after a disagreement or after a quarrel. And uh, I don't know whether you have experienced this, I think all of us have, in one way or the other, even if you are not married to your friends or your siblings or parents, so they have offended them, saying words that are unkind, or being said upon things that are true or unkind. And reconciling, making up, sometimes is difficult, based on a few reasons. Number one, it could be we have to put out our pride to say sorry, and it's quite difficult. You know. Or we are too ashamed because the hurt we cause someone is so much, and we feel so ashamed to meet to see the person again. Or we feel so guilty for the things that we have said. You know. And or we are afraid that when we go and try to make up with a person, we may face with rejection. Right? The person may not forgive us, the person may still be angry with us. And the tension and the kind of feeling you know, is, is hard. Right? Especially husband and wife, before you go to bed, you know, and not in good terms with your husband. Let's say a clock in good terms with Esther. You know, it's hard to go to the, the same bed again to speak to side by side. It's hard, the feeling is hard. You know? So, this is the same feeling. You know, over here in uh, Song of Solomon, Chapter 5, the previous chapter, we saw the bride herself had lost her first love. Uh, this is a drawing I found on the internet, something like this. You know, so she had hanged out her clothes, and all day she tells the king to go away, she's not free. You know, she's very inconvenient to meet her. Now, and the king was waiting outside, knocking at the door for a long time, probably. And after they finally, after a long time, she got up, she opened the door, the king is gone. You know, that's why the last word there is love sick. Okay, that was what we, we talked about last week in chapter 5. Why, why was the bride treating the king this way? And we observed that there's a, a few possibilities that her heart was drifting away. Her heart was drifting. She was probably discontented or she became complacent about the relationship. You know? and, but moreover, the king's love and the loving words moved her. And finally, she got up and she looked for the king, opened up the door, but the king has gone. You know? and so she was faced with discipline by the watchman. She was rebuked by the daughters of Jerusalem in a very gentle way. And she finally remembers the quality of the king, one that was patient and kind. And in the presence of this king, actually brings her close to God himself, focus, help her to focus on God. So now this bride comes to her senses, and she's humbly seeking the king now, seeking her husband. And she genuinely repented. She wanted to make up. She wanted to reconcile. But we asked some questions. Here. Well, some of this question probably goes through her mind too. What would it be like to be up now with the king? Will she face with many obstacles? Will she be rejected? Is the king still angry with her because of her own stubbornness and her, her own her willfulness? And so that leaves us there in chapter 5. And it's like those uh, episodes, like those uh, love story episodes, like that leave them with them with some of these questions. They say, okay, stay here until the next episode. Okay. So now, chapter 6 is the next episode. And let's go to God in prayer as we look at chapter 6 itself. Father God, we, uh, as we examine your word together, uh, we pray that God you help us to understand your word. May your Holy Spirit teach us. May your Holy Spirit energize us. And also, we Spirit, really bring your word deep into our hearts. That we not, we will not just listen, but we be, we will become our convictions in our lives, and also that God we will practice your word in our lives. And the most of all, that we open our eyes and we may see your wondrous love for us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Verse one to three, the place for making up. Verse one, the woman of Jerusalem. Or sometimes you see that the others were asking, her, Where do you find the king? Where can you go and find the king now that he has gone? You know, then does the bride know where to find the king? That's a question asked to her by 
the women of Jerusalem or the, the, the ladies of their the friends. Maybe. And somehow, you look at the verse, somehow she knows where to find the king. She knows where to find the where, verse 2 says, the garden. She knows where to find the king. And this, this whole idea of garden appears uh, in the whole idea in chapter 4 and chapter 5. In three times, the garden in chapter 4, it says, she was welcoming the king into her garden. Chapter 4, verse 16. Chapter 5, verse, uh, chapter five verse 1, the king actually entered into his garden, his own garden. And later in chapter 6, verse 15, Actually, she said she entered, she was recording her, her experience entering into the garden. But in our version, put there as uh, verse 11, you put there as the orchard. But it's come from original words, same as the word as garden, you know, coming into the garden. It's so it seems that this place that she knows where to find the king is a place of intimacy. It's a place that you see in the previous verse, in chapter 4, you're talking about marriage. It's a place of safety for the relationship. So, garden. May signify this place of intimacy, or may signify this whole understanding of her coming home to the king, coming home to the king itself. She knew where to find the king, and she was even bold that she can approach the king and she can come and be reconciled to the king. You see her bonus here in verse two. He says, "At the end of this, I know where to find the king." Then she says, "Verse three, she says, but my beloved is mine." And I'm his. She's very sure that what the king has, the words that the king had given to her, it still stand after the marriage in chapter four. It still stand. And she's, she even know the heart of the king. What is the king like over here? So in verse three, he said, in, uh, three times he says the king he, he gazed in the garden, which is actually the word for shepherd in the garden, and. End of chapter, verse 3, he said he gazes among the lily. It's actually the word again is for shepherding among the lily. She knows the shepherd heart of the king. And so I put that she's, she's bold to approach the king. She dares to come back to make up with the king, to be reconciled with the king. After she had offended him, after she had gone wayward, after she was being so willful, because she was assured of the faithfulness of the king, that she belongs to the king. The king belongs to her. And at the same time, she also knows the shepherd heart of the king. The heart that always go out and seek the boss. This is the heart of the king. And so earlier when we asked, what would it be like when the bride itself had looked for the king to make up? Would she face obstacle? We asked whether she would, would she be rejected by the king because of her own stubbornness and willfulness. But we see the, the possibility of the king that now she recalled that in verse 4 to 10, and I put that as a strength, I think the better one I put as I think about it should be the possibility of for making up. Okay, you see the words of the lover, the king towards her. Begin with verse 4. I put that as a kind of like a sandwich thing. It begins with verse 4, it ends with verse 10. The sandwich thing is it begin with two uh, verse, uh, verse 4, sorry, I put that verse 3. Uh, verse 4, it begins uh, with two beautiful mountains, Tazar and the Jerusalem, then describing her as a banner, and it ends again with two big great lights or beautiful lights, the sun and the moon, and also the banner. You see that's a like, kind of like a, a sandwich over there. You know? And so this segment here is basically saying that the most important thing to describe here in the eyes of the king, the, the words of, his, of the king to her is that you are beautiful. You are beautiful like the two beautiful mountains and like the banner of soldiers. And you are beautiful like two great lights and the banners of Sujia. So in the eyes of the queen, uh, in the eyes of the king, the queen, or the bride herself, remains beautiful. She remains beautiful. So the most important thing, the most important thing, the possibility for this making up is because of the king's perspective or the king's view towards his bride. How the king views the bride. And you see in a little bit of details of uh, verse 5 to 7. This five to seven describe the different features there, and you notice these features was actually already mentioned in chapter four. It was a repeat. It was a repeat of chapter four. So, and in chapter four there was a marriage scene when the king come for the bride, and he repeats all these describing the features again in details. So I put that as a whole, what you can see is the king still see the initial glory, uh, beauty, 
of the bride. And she, you overlooked all the things that you've done, overlook her mistakes, overlook her, her willfulness, her stubbornness. She overlooked all this. What she sees in her, what she sees in her, was that initial glory and beauty. And as he said, it's possible for making up the cause, the king still see the work in that willful bride, in that stubborn, wayward bride of this. You, know, you still see that work, not because of the queen herself, not because of the bride herself, but because of just how he wanted her to be. He put that value and see the value in her, see that work in her. And verse 8 and 9, in fact, not just that, he views her, I put here, he views her as someone who is very unique. He compares her to the queen, to the concubines, to the virgins, or to the uh, maidens. It's just like the king is like, saying this. So I've seen many, many glorious queens before. The king is like saying to the queen, or she's saying that something like, I've seen very attractive concubines before. I've come across very young and sweet maidens before. But you, you are just different. You are just you. You're just unique before me. You're just an individual that I know that's just special to me. This is what the king is saying to her. So it's how the king views uh, the bride. She, she's not a digit before him. She's not a number before him. She's a special, unique individual before him. So we see over here in chapter 5, the bride offended the king. She came humbly and sincerely seeking the king again. And over here, she was not faced with hostility or rejection. She was actually like coming home to the king. King's garden. And the making up is possible because of how the king views the bride. She's not seeing her like any other people. She's just different before the bride, uh, before the king himself. The king sees the world in her. Even though she made all the mistakes to the king to see that world in her. And the king still treat her as a unique individual. What is the response of the king? How do you call this? The response of the king. It's called grace. And I define here grace means we can always restart again. Or we can start a new again. Grace means we can start a new again. The, the bride has offended the king. But the king is so gracious, offer these words of assurance to her that he or she can always start again. She can always start again. This is a kind of key towards the bride. In fact, when Solomon penned this down, Solomon was trying to help the Israelites. This is the kind of lover that the Israelites have. This is how God Israelite has in the context of Old Testament. This is, this is how Yahweh, God the Lord, will speak to the Israelites, his bride. One example, Psalms 103, when they sin against God, this is what God will say. Some part of it is cut off. He said, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is yours, his steadfast love, towards those who fear him, those who come humbly before him. As far as east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. This is how the Lord God treats this adulterous nation, Israel. He always Give them grace, always want to restart, give them a new beginning again. And this is how it is for us as well as believers in the New Testament. In the New Testament, this is what Lord Jesus offered to us. Let me show you that verse. 1 John 1 9, verse appeared to us. He said, If we confess our sins, if we come humbly before Him, we confess and repent. He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful because he promised. He promised the forgiveness of sin. And when we come before Him humbly and repent like the bride herself, He promised for reconciliation. He promised that we can make up with Him again. And He's just because the punishment for our sin is punished on the cross. He's just. He did not just close His eyes on our sin. Our sin must be punished. That's why He's just. But the, that punishment is done on the cross when Jesus died on the cross for our sin and He rose victoriously. And because of that, we have full forgiveness of sin from unrighteousness. He 
give us a new beginning again. And we can do that as a Christian every day. Every night when we offend him. Because grace means we can restart again. What's some implication for us? Application for us as Christians? So when we offend the Lord, when we bow down to the idols of our life, when we sin against Him or against people around us, what should we do? After that, we should come humbly in repentance, telling God that this is something that you have wrong, you have done wrong, you have sinned against Him, your heart has gone wayward from Him. Like what pastor pray that we have some distraction or destructive things that cause us to love God again. We pray, confess to Him. And I would have not come by the gospel of work. Please do not come to God by the gospel of work. Because God treated us with the gospel of grace. What is the gospel of work? Well, sometimes people, that's how people do it in the gospel of work. When they sin, or when they done something wrong, or they have a big quarrel with someone and feel so bad about it, or they offended uh, their, their friends and neighbors, or they, they feel so bad about it, and they have done something, and they watch something that they shouldn't do, that they shouldn't watch, done something, or say something that they shouldn't, they shouldn't say. What's the gospel look like? Well, they will stay away from church. And say, ah, I'm so lousy. I, I shouldn't be coming to church. I mean, let me clean myself up first before I come back to church. This is the gospel of work. None of us here by works. All of us are coming into this place by the very sure grace of God. Right? Our gospel of work is going be like when they've done something wrong, they feel so bad, they say, ah, I shouldn't pray. Because when I'm good enough, then I'll pray. This is the gospel of work. Or I, I stay away even from Holy Communion. When I'm when I Holy Communion, I woke up because I, I don't feel worthy today. Which one of us are worthy to take the Holy Communion in the first place? Aren't we here surely by the grace of God, by what Jesus has done for us? And some of people will even punish themselves when they have done something wrong. And then they punish themselves and do whatever. So this is the gospel of God because all punishment has been completed on the cross. It has been completed on the cross. So we come hungry, repent from our sin. By God's grace, by this power of the Holy Spirit, not to commit a sin again and move and move on. Constantly looking at the grace of God at the cross. That the price has already been paid for us. So do not come back to God by the work, by the gospel of works. Because grace has been done for us. If people do that, they don't understand grace. Because God's response to us is grace that we can begin again. God in us, God sees the glory that He wants, the beauty that He wants. Not because we are good, but because Christ brings them in us. He wants to form us to be a little Christ, whatever we are. He wants to form the image of His Son in us. He sees that glory in us. Not because we are good, because He sees in us. It's a view of the King to the earth towards us that makes it possible for us to come back. So what should we do? I put it, you should ask. You, put, I put it, uh, you should repent and ask for forgiveness through Jesus. Always look at the cross. Always look at the cross, not at ourselves. Always look at how God is viewing us. The kings value us, not because we are good, but because Jesus has purchased us and he has put his glory in us. He's going to form us to be a little Christ. Second implication, that if people have offended you, because you may have offended God, but now if other people have offended you, what should we do? Well, you ask yourself, do we give gracious words, words of assurance and forgiveness? If people have offended you. Second, take gracious actions. By accepting the person, don't exclude the person, but being inclusive in the person. Because we have to remember that we ourselves forgiven, we are made right with God, we are reconciled to God because He gave us grace. So therefore, we must continue to dispense a gracious word and gracious attitude and actions to people around us. 
were completed. This is a gracious word, and this is a gracious response that the king has done to the bride and draws the bride to, the, to himself. And he calls, she recalls how she actually receives this kind of grace in the next portion of, the, of, of Solomon 6, 11 to 13. And they're surprised by this meeting. She was like describing the journey back to the garden, verse 11. She said, I, I, I went down to the nut, of, nut orchard of the nut garden, actually, the original one in the garden. You know, so, so you see, I, I was dragged down, and verse 12 is quite a difficult verse. Okay, verse 12 is quite a difficult verse. It says, Before I was aware, my desire set in among the chariots of the king's men, uh, priests. It is something like this. Okay, there's, there's, you must imagine this is a poetic writing. You must imagine, you must understand this is a poetic uh, writing. Imagine along with me. She was like going down the road, going back to the garden, coming back home to the king. And suddenly, before she was aware, her desire of wanting to make up with the king, wanting to be reconciled with the king, was totally met with surprise. You know, it was almost like she was walking, and surprisingly, the king's chariots came and picked her up. You know, the, the king's chariots was like waiting for her to come home. And they spotted her before this, she spotted them. And by surprise, they came and it was like she they scooped her up and sat in the chariots, the king's chariots with her nobles. You know, and I feel like she was surprised by this homecoming, this welcoming that she received. And not just that, she was so surprised by this party, verse 13, by the nobles. The nobles was like, come home. Come back, come back, she the right, come home. You know, and she was surprised by this uh, celebration that she actually enjoyed of homecoming. And the last verse, put there, and uh, the last part of the verse, the lead says, that Why should you look upon the Shinomite as upon the dance between two armies? The word why is not the best translation because the original word really means what. What? It's, it's the same word as manner, what. You know, so this is the same word here. So it should maybe a better translation is what uh, what are you looking for in the Shinomites? What are you looking for in the Shinomites? You know, and the answer is a dance of two companies or two armies. And this word two companies was used three times in Genesis 32. <coughs> two companies or two armies. Remember Genesis 32, let me just give you a quick background, Genesis 32. Genesis 32. And this phrase appeared three times there. You know, it begin in Genesis chapter 32 when, when Jacob departed from Laban, who he made a, he offended him. Laban also offended uh, Jacob. Jacob also offended Laban. So he was coming down south, and somebody, some, uh, some of his uh, uh, servant came running to him and says, Esau is coming. Wow, Esau that he has offended many years ago. He cheated his birthright, remember? So he was scared. And Esau wasn't coming alone. He said Esau was coming with 400 men. You know what? Jacob was like, yeah, yeah. Wow, he just offended someone, going down some. Esau coming with 400 soldiers. Then he's like, then he has his own children and servants and wives with him. He's like, what am I going to do? So in that kind of desperation, uncertainty, because his past sin of offending offending Esau was now meeting up with him. And then, verse in chapter 32 in Genesis, it says, then suddenly he saw a company of angels. So he has his own company of his young children and wives and all these very vulnerable company. But he saw another company, which is a company of angels. It was God graciously assuring protection for Jacob. God is telling Jacob, don't worry, you are not going by this big company. There is one company accompanying you, which is a whole company of angels that will protect you. For this assuring of protection. And therefore, Jacob named the place two companies, which is really this original word for this. This word here, two armies. And over here, so the question asked in end of chapter, uh, verse 13 is, what, what are you looking for? What are you looking at? What are you looking for? 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 And the Shunamite, the answer is the surprise, 
because she was surprising of this, surprised by this gracious protection of this uncertain bride coming home because she had offended the king, but she was met with this assurance of protection, assurance of um, the chariots will bring her home safely, will bring her back in her garden safely. How do we appreciate this, uh, this portion here? Well, when the bride offended the king and returns humbly, she genuinely seek reconciliation and making up. She was met with grace, the grace of the king, and even more. She was surprised by the welcoming that the king issued, the celebration of the noble, and also this comforting assurance of protection that she would, he would bring her home safely. So when Solomon wrote this, he's telling, almost teaching in the Israelites that the adulterous Israelites, when they return back, if they humble themselves, forsake their sins and their idol, and they return back to Yahweh, to God, their king, and they genuinely repent, they will see the grace of God appearing to them, and the grace and assurance of forgiveness. They will have God's blessing written up to them. Come welcoming, assurance, blessings. Just like in the book of Malachi, which is the which is actually scolding the Israelites people, he says, You will have to try to test me, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there's no more need. There's no more need. It's almost like the words of Malachi who say that this is what God is going to do with us. So when we sinners today, New Testament time, when we repent of our sin, when you and I genuinely seek forgiveness from the Lord Jesus, the same thing will happen with us. And you'll see the grace of God totally sufficient in Jesus alone. Because He died for our sin so that we can have a new start again. And He will receive us. Right on earth here, He will receive us on, on, on here on earth will be with his family in the church. He will receive us in the church family. And in the future to come, he will receive us a home in glory, a new heaven and new earth. And now, we also be comforted with a protection as well. He has given us the seal of his Holy Spirit. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit and we will be protected. We will, he will protect us, he will send us home safely. He will ensure that we will meet the Lord Jesus face to face with and for the future, we will have the comfort as well in our new home, a new heaven and new earth. There will no more, you will, you will come into this place, assurance and the comfort will be there. No more sin, no more death, no more pain, no more openness and arguments because of sin. It's a kind of assurance that God is giving us as this believer as well. We will continue to meditate on this and meditate on this kind of love God as well. Thank you, Lord, for your constant grace for us. We know, Lord, that you are new every morning. Your steadfast love and your mercy, you always make new every morning for us that we can always begin again. Thank you for such grace. We do not deserve it. We thank you for Jesus who died on the cross to make this available for us. That we can make up with you. We can be reconciled with you. Give thanks to you. We pray in Jesus.